Good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully everyone is staying safe and keeping healthy. Um, for those who just join us, um, question and answers are uh, an open forum for you. Please be, uh, please be aware there's a chat box uh, that you can write your questions in. And your question and answers also is, is uh, right there on your screen. Be sure to go ahead and ask questions as Lisa is um, doing her presentation, okay? Our presenter today is Lisa Anderson, founder and president of LMA Consulting Group, a firm that specializes in manufacturing strategy and end-to-end -end supply chain transformation. Lisa, as you also know, is our president of the Apex Inland Empire chapter. Lisa has been named in the top 46th most influential in supply chain management by SAP and is a much sought after speaker and an influencer and is being called upon today for supply chain and manufacturing uh, leaders as they wish to understand her point of view as it relates to the impact of COVID-19. She has been featured in many radio shows recently. If you have not heard them, we encourage you to go to her website, lmaconsulting.com, and check out all her radio show commentaries. And also, she has been quoted in many newspapers with regard to the impact of COVID-19 on manufacturing, distribution, and basically understanding the end-to-end -end supply chain impact of this situation. So with that, Lisa, tell us, where is the toilet paper? <laughs> yep, I, everybody does want to know. I, uh, I have actually been called by sports radio to comment on where's the toilet paper, because after all, no one is uh, playing sports these days. So, um, so before I get started, though, I'd like to uh, make sure that I um, say that our uh, Apex Inland Empire uh, chapter is um, hosting these uh, navigating through volatility webinar series uh, on how to navigate through this COVID-19 and emerge successfully out the other side. So we would uh, welcome you to join us on our future uh, sessions. We continue to add them. We have um, a couple coming up on the ports and um, on uh, how to create even uh, closer relationships with customers um and uh, several others so uh please uh join us for those but in the meantime we'll talk about where's the toilet paper in essence it's the uh misalignment of demand and supply so let's see here all right so this is what my grocery store looks like i don't know about yours but well actually most of the time mine has zero on the on the um wall uh, toilet, but toilet paper is actually produced in the U.S., so it's not as though we're waiting for it to be shipped from Asia or something. So it's just a matter of hoarding, in essence. We're all worried, and I don't know, we none of us want to run out of toilet paper. So hoarding has created this misalignment of demand uh, because a um, you know each each person. Um, doubles their consumption of toilet paper as far as what they purchase, which unfortunately in the beginning we did much more than that, but let's just say we doubled our consumption. It's created a, a, a complete uh, ripple throughout the supply chain uh, where, you know, our the stores are supplied by uh, distribution centers uh, and those distribution centers are, you know, it depends on the uh, uh, on each individual store's supply chain, but generally speaking, the simplest of matters is as each store is bought, supplied by a distribution center. For a while, my store told me that you know the distribution center was just supplying them as fast as they could, but eventually the distribution center ran low on toilet paper as well, as well as other supplies. Uh, and then they had to be supplied by the next person in the supply chain. And then it continues to go because there's, you know, our supply chains these days are quite extended. Uh, and then there's material suppliers, so you can't just produce when you want more. So the, 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 this has created a vast ripple in the supply chain. And um, I talked about this on, you know, one of my uh, interviews was on Rip City Radio. So I'll um, uh, attach this uh, slide deck uh, to our um, Apex Inland, Inland Empire um, uh, webpage when we're finished. And then once we actually get 
this supply back, you know, once things calm down and everyone is not hoarding toilet paper anymore, the resupply of toilet paper and everything else is going to create like a new ripple effect. So we'll talk a bit more about all of this. So this is what I'm talking about is the bowl of effect. Those of you that are um, APEX students and or APEX instructors will know what this is. Uh, clients and colleagues, some of you may have heard of it. Uh, but uh, the bullwhip effect is like as it sounds, it's, you know, as you can see in the, the visual here, it looks like um, you start with the customer who typically speaking, the bullwhip is just a small increase in demand by multiple customers. Obviously, with the toilet paper effect, it's more than a small increase in demand because we all went out and probably bought three to five times as much as we needed, um, and which created a huge impact in the customer. But this is assuming a small impact. So let's just assume that we only bought, um, well, uh, we only bought like 20% more, which would definitely not be true, but let's just pretend that. So if we only bought 20% more, you know, like this is the simplest of supply chains as well, because every client that I have has more more uh, legs to their supply chain than this but this does gives you an idea goes from the customer to the distributor and then the ripple gets larger because you know we don't know what's going on why the customer is doing this i mean in this case we know what's going on but uh, the distributor is trying to respond everybody starts ordering more the manufacturer it's next in line you know sees even a bigger ripple effect and orders even more and then the supplier at the uh at the end, like sees this massive uh, increase. And then the supplier, supplier, and the supplier, 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 it, it continues to get worse and worse as you go through the supply chain. So soon we have uh, no toilet paper on any of the shelves, which is the situation we have at hand, when we actually can produce this uh, in the US. And, um, you know, those uh, facilities are considered essential, so they're still running. Of course, there could be. Um, you know, they, they could be down in, in terms of people, but I would say we're going to talk a bit about the status of the supply chain and then come back to how we resolve this, but that's certainly not the problem. It's the, it's the uh, hoarding of demand that's creating this issue. So it gets the whole supply chain off kilter. So the problem here is beyond the current situation, what do we do when we try to get it back in shape again? One of our Apex Inland Empire board members is um, works with Niagara, supplies uh, bottled water. They're seeing the same thing. They can't keep it on the shelves. It's ridiculous. If if uh, and um, he's in purchasing. So if he was to order what what the um, what the demand is showing, it would be a ridiculous um, high order. So what should he, what should we do? Because you know where everybody keeps buying this. So it's really a challenge because eventually. It's just going to all shut off and it's going to go to zero, which will be a um, uh, certainly a big problem. So I wanted to bring this up next, and that is the um, inventory levels or capacity levels. So when we when we um, we're going through this supply chain, uh, each person in line um, can address part of these ripples uh, in the supply chain if they have inventory, because inventory, the point of inventory is actually there is no point of having inventory if it's not going to cover your demand changes, demand volatility, which is what we're experiencing now, delivery performance issues, which is really not the issue right now, um, or like transaction accuracies. But at this point, our demand is ridiculous. So as you can see, the, the part that's covered, this is uh, water and rocks in, in the water. So the part that's covered by water is inventory. So it means that, you know, we could, we can experience some ripple in demand and you know we won't know the difference it doesn't matter but once we go past where the water line is we're going to we're going to have a big problem and so that's the point of inventory and as we all know because we live in the lean world you know we're not prone to having extra inventory um but what what does extra mean is really the question i mean no one plans for a pandemic however there are going to be um some uh, companies that have a strategic inventory of certain key, um, could be of uh, the finished good like toilet paper, or it could be of key raw materials because the next person in line is going to be the raw material supplier. And if you don't have raw materials, it doesn't matter how many people you have and how many shifts you have, you're not going to be able to make up for the demand spike. 
So the question is, how much strategic, tr strategic inventory do we have uh, throughout our supply chain and where is it? Because where is it? It's a whole other story as well. So um, now I thought I'd back up for a minute here and talk a little bit about the current state of manufacturing and supply chain. I've been very, very busy um, since this uh, coronavirus has hit. Uh, working with clients and that, that are dealing with some of these spikes, but also working on um, this webinar series and getting in touch with all of the experts in these industries so that we could, you know, provide as best information as we can um, to, uh, to folks. So from a manufacturing point of view, I see that I uh, need to update my bottom line here, but nevertheless, uh, CMTA, which is California Manufacturing Technology, um, Association, I believe, um, did a, a quick survey. It, you know, it wouldn't be statistically correct, but they did a survey, and 73% of manufacturers said that they were operating at greater than 50%. So, manufacturing all in all is holding up a lot better than a lot of other industries for sure. And then informal surveys for uh, folks who are have all manufacturing clients, which I do as well. Uh, Typically speaking, the clients are diversified enough so that they have some essential, uh, what are considered essential uh, businesses that they're supporting and some that are considered non-essential or that, you know, the foot traffic is down in the grocery stores and, you know, certain items aren't the ones that we're trying to hoard. So um, they have spikes in demand, unfortunately demand that makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, some of them are going up like crazy and others are dropping off like no tomorrow. So, but all in all, uh, after talking with a lot of different people and I'm also in a CEO group where um, they have they have multiple groups of CEOs throughout the area that are all manufacturers. Typically speaking, they are all still running. Now I do have one client that shut down because they weren't considered essential, uh, but, all in all, I would say 70 to 80 percent of manufacturers are still running currently in Southern California because they supply key industries, which would be food. Of course, food is largely running. Of course, it depends on who you supply. I do um, work with a food bar manufacturer. One of their clients is Starbucks, and Starbucks is by no means um, running at full operations right now. So that volume has uh, tanked. However, uh, food bars that people would buy in the grocery stores that they would consider ones that they could store and hoard, those would be, um, you know, having a spike in demand. So generally speaking though, 70 to 80% of uh, manufacturers are running and the, of the ones that are running, I would say that the, we also believe that they're running at 70 to 80% capacity. So um, it's a, uh, and the 70 to 80% of those that are running, I actually, from most of the surveys, it's really 80 to 90%, but I'm, I'm being conservative here. So obviously food and medical are up and non-essential, uh, you know, defense is still running. Obviously commercial aerospace is like in, in, the, in the tank, shall we say. Um, but um, uh, um, the, uh, uh, a lot of the industries that are in Southern California support these key industries like building products, construction products is considered essential. Logistics is considered essential. So that's why we have the vast majority are running. As I said, actually out of everybody I talked to, there's only like a handful of people who know of anyone that wasn't running. It's just whether they're running, you know, they're only running to about 70 to 80% though. Um, but, so the tricky part that they're having in manufacturing is keeping enough employees. Um, with that said, they're not like dropping like flies with COVID-19, thank goodness. Uh, but you know, there's, there's some, certainly concerns about that. People have um, children, so they're having to have flexible work schedules or they may not be able to come in. So those types of things are, or they're just uh, afraid. So that, that, was, that did come up in my conversations with folks. But generally speaking, that's not, it's not, a severe enough problem where it's causing an issue. Uh, they're able to ramp up. And the, but the supply chain is a big challenge in manufacturing. So getting your, getting the materials um, from others is, is certainly more of a challenge. 
So let's see, next we have um, the Asian supply chain. So uh, certainly this virus started in China, so they had a shutdown far um, quicker than we did. And it, of course it came right on the, um, at the same time as Chinese New Year. So generally speaking, there's been a delay of two to three months in the Asian supply chain because of the uh, coronavirus. But China is back now to 80 to 90 percent. And most everybody that I'm talking to is saying 90 percent. However, uh, John Tulak was on our webinar last week, I believe, where he was telling us about all the different um, countries around the world and what's happening. And he said that although China is at 90 percent, they're not likely to go to 100 percent anytime soon because they have sent the migrant workers home and they're, they're, there's no sign of them coming back. However, they may not be needed right now because our demand is um, uh, re being reduced uh, as well as the demand in Asia. So nevertheless, they are back and running. Um, South Korea and Vietnam wasn't, weren't as impacted uh, as, uh, as China was. So they're, but however, their demand is off because they supplied China. So it's a catch 22, but they weren't, they weren't really impacted nearly the same, to the same degree from the coronavirus. And then uh, a Kearney study said that re a reshoring index shows that shows a dramatic reversal of a five-year trend uh, with domestic U.S. manufacturing in 2019 gained significantly greater than the other 14 Asian exporters. So what that means is before this coronavirus hit, uh, we were already seeing a dramatic change uh, in our sourcing of uh, supply and we're moving back towards uh, the US and Mexico. And certainly that's only gonna, gonna be exaggerated further with this coronavirus. So it's, um, there's a lot of moving pieces that's gonna create this uh, supply shock, if you will, a resupply shock. And what can we do about it all? So the bottom line really from an Asian su supply chain point of view is, is that they are back online but now we're down and so there's really nowhere to send everything. And so it's gonna create havoc uh, at the ports and everywhere else. And generally speaking, uh, manufacturing is starting to move much quicker to the US and Mexico and to smaller Southeastern Asian nations like led by Vietnam uh, because they're trying to find a more, I don't know, I mean, now that, uh, prices have con gone in alignment, uh, really, for non-commodity products. They're looking for, you know, other options. So if you are dealing in a commodity product, it probably won't come back uh, to the U.S. and Mexico unless they find a way to make it more value added, but it will probably move. Now, it can't all move from China anytime soon. So this is going to be a very um, interesting and worrisome situation to navigate because certainly not everybody can move out of China at once and it would also create havoc to, to have that happen. So uh, it's going to be um, tricky. For all, for, it's gonna be really neat. We're gonna be in uh, greater demand as supply chain leaders than ever before to try to figure out what to do no matter where you are in the supply chain. So the ports, the ports are operating but the volume is down. So they, of course, experienced the delay from Asia. So for two to three months uh, during the coronavirus, they weren't, you know, they weren't receiving very many ships at all. And there was a stockpile of empties in the all in the wrong place, which is, which is part of the problem here. Uh, like I said, China's back online, about 80 to 90%. And the ports are operating about 85% of operations. I just uh, was on a call on Friday about that. Um, and the workers really aren't a problem. I mean, they're they're continuing to operate at this 85% level and it's not, not showing an issue. Uh, however, all in all, the volume is down. So Long Beach um, container volume was down 6.8% in Q1. Now that might be down versus their forecast. So it's not like the LA number is at 18%. That's year over year. So you got to know what numbers you're looking at. But nevertheless, they are both down in Q1. And that's because of the coronavirus as well as, I don't know, could be the problem is this reshoring is getting mixed up with coronavirus. So who knows what's going on, which is part of this how do we get alignment between demand and supply? Um, and then Q2 is estimated though to be really bad because of the, uh, you know, because of the US being shut down. So it's estimated to be at 
negative 14% for Long Beach. And in March, which is the only data that we have, you know, firm, it was 30% down. Um, and uh, one thing that David Porter said on our webinar last week, and if you weren't able to catch the, the webinar on the transportation, um, on transportation and staffing and where things stood, I thought he did a fabulous job. It's in our archives and you should check it out. But he basically said that more ships are parked uh, than they were, than were parked in 2008, 2009. So it's, um, now think about this, they're parked, but parked where? They're all parked in the wrong place, of course. So that's the problem with these types of things. When you have a supply spike and then a trough, everything is always in the wrong spot. And so I, I see that we have a few questions. So let me ask, ask them here. So we have, by we, are we going to be in greater demand? Do you mean US manufacturing? Yes, US manufacturing is going to increase for sure. Uh, it, the reshoring uh, study showed that even before coronavirus, there was a dramatic shift. Now dramatic is dramatic, but I mean, it's um, compared to where we were before, there's a lot of companies that are looking at bringing uh, volume back to the US. And the reason is, is that the tariffs was one, but one is another one that I've been talking about for a long time now is the Amazon effect. And that's that everybody wants everything right away, which right now everybody, everybody wants toilet paper right away, but everybody wants everything right away. So it's very hard to do if you have to wait three months for it to get here. And how do you predict? What inventory do you have on hand? Where do you place strategic inventory? It's just all a problem. So uh, with the Amazon effect taking place, costs coming into alignment, to the total cost, of course the cost of labor is gonna still be less in China, but the total cost, if you add up all of the inventory costs, all of the IP costs, all of the costs involved are in alignment, unless you're a commodity product. If you're a commodity product, you're not gonna, you're probably not gonna move it to the US. You might move it to Mexico, or you might just move it to Southeast Asia. But basically, all in all, lots of uh, people are moving, according to the studies, a lot of people are looking at moving back to the US, and that has definitely spiked since the coronavirus. And it's, um, I can tell you that my clients are thinking the same. And then did the port have anything to do with turning shipments back? Um, well, they didn't turn, I think the deal is, is that they're congested. So if they, or I should say, like when you have everything that's in the wrong place, you have backups, you have like lines in the grocery store, right? To get in, like my, my grocery store will only allow a certain number of people in. So you have, you have lines in all the wrong places, but you have product in all the wrong places. So everything's in the wrong place. So the port's not like turning people away, at least according to what they said, but they, um, but they're trying to operate, you know, these aren't, these aren't simple um, operations to keep going. So they're, they're dealing with what they have, which is the, uh, right, right now they, they're expecting a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of ships. And the problem with that is, is all of our warehouses are full, which we'll talk about in a minute. Now I see Ellen is asking here. I heard that there are different manufacturers that make household toilet paper and others that make commercial toilet paper for restaurants or businesses. Why don't the commercial makers change packaging for household use? Totally agree, Ellen. That's exactly what I've been like harping on here. And one of the things I mentioned on every radio show I was on is, is that we need to not only convert, um, you know, like like products. So like you said, commercial toilet paper to household toilet paper and vice versa, because certainly with everybody shut down, commercial toilet paper is really not needed uh, very much anyway. I mean, our, just our essential businesses are minuscule compared to, um, in total, compared to every, all the other businesses. So we, we absolutely should be doing that. I'm sure that they are working on that. But that just speaks to one of the other topics we'll talk about, which is, you know, our ability to be agile and be flexible. But also, how can we repurpose equipment? How can we repurpose skills? Um, you know, making, uh, and I'll get to some of the solutions here, but, you know, since you asked, I'll just bring it up, is that's what um, the CMTA, which is the, like I said, the California Manufacturing uh, Association is, is, um, has a list of folks who can repurpose or re, you know, do um, move skills. And so they're, they're trying to do this. Um, and that's one of the reasons why Apex and Linden Empire is doing these webinars is 
we, and we're sending out um, emails because we have there are several groups that are trying to coordinate that to, to happen. So I think that's uh, you know a great great point, and I am in totally on board with that. Now Parazad's asking if if I am a toilet paper or a mask manufacturer, should I increase my capacity if I had surge capacity, or will I be stuck with inventory? <laughs> well, that's a good question. That's what. Uh, Kevin asked, who's, uh, who works with the bottling manufacturer. So really what's happening here is if you're a toilet paper or a mass manufacturer, for sure you should be increasing your capacity right now because um, it, this is not going to, the latest statistics according to John Tulak, who was on our uh, webinar last week and from all the other uh, folks is, is that um, this is not likely to go away for good until the vaccine is developed, which is gonna be a year. That doesn't mean that it'll, hopefully some of these other medicines that are being developed will work so that we can get back to more of a regular life. Because if we, if we don't, we're gonna have a serious issue because like our economy you know, cannot function with everybody sitting in their house. With that said though, um, it's likely to come back. It's going to, I mean, the mask manufacturers are absolutely needed. I mean, toilet paper after all, it's not as though we're gonna need more toilet paper than we used to need in the past. So that's that's a little iffy. I mean, I would be cautious about uh, what to do there uh, because you don't wanna go too far in the other direction. And unfortunately, toilet paper is bulky, so it's hard to store. And I mean, you're gonna have to err a little bit on the side of having more than you need because there's such a need right now. And uh, those, those folks that have supply are gonna be remembered. So you're gonna to have to go a little bit on that side, but remember anything that you produce extra, suddenly it's gonna get turned off and then you're gonna to have to figure out a way to store it or repurpose it or something. Um, from a mass manufacturing standpoint though, for sure um, the recommendation would be to increase capacity. So add shifts, you know, run overtime, um, partner with another organization that has like type skills that may not do anything like what you do, but they have people who are available because they've been shut down and they um, might want to keep them employed and they, they could have some light skills. So there's, there's a lot of options and people who are making temporary partnerships that are willing to do things like that um, are going to be much more successful than somebody who plodge, you know, plodges away every day trying to, you know, increase capacity by 2% a day. It's just not going to cut it. I mean, you're going to be left in the dust. Uh, now let's see, Parazad's saying, if consumers are not going to brick and mortar stores, what can I do now to improve my sales online? Oh, wow, that, that's a good question. I, I'll, I'll, I'll just keep answering these questions because um, I think it's important and um, we'll get through what we can and then we'll uh, go from there. So that's um, actually, I was just on a call earlier, right before this meeting with a client. This client does make food um, and so they, but they're strangely enough seeing a decrease in volume. They saw a really, really big increase, not surprisingly. And then they saw it drop off a cliff, you know, like, of course it did not do, but that's what, that's what they're seeing. And so um, the problem is, is that the brick and mortar stores don't have the foot traffic, even the grocery stores in this case, or the targets don't have the same foot traffic because of this um, pandemic. So what they're seeing, and uh, uh, is, is about 30% less um, volume because of the um, fact that there's smaller foot traffic. Certainly for non-essential items, uh, the volume has dropped off even more because consumer buying behaviors are changing. So what they are seeing though, is, is that the e-commerce, uh, anything that was sold through e-commerce channels, is increasing. So you're absolutely right, Barza, that that's the that is what's on fire right now. And I um, I think one of my future slides, so I will get there, has statistics about the hiring going on in e-commerce. But so we'll come back to this. But basically, in in e-commerce, it's unfortunately it's not a snap of your fingers and it'll all be sold online. Story. It never is that simple. But um, you should start now for sure. E-commerce is um, not going to go away. The good news here is, is that even after the pandemic, people who never even used like Zoom before are using Zoom. Like I went, I had a Easter um, Zoom call with my mom, my aunts, my uh, 
brothers and nephews and whatnot else. And most of, a lot of those people have never used Zoom before. But now that they've done it, they were like, well, this is kind of cool. We'll do this again. Well, the same thing is happening here with e-commerce is once they've ordered online, it's not like they'll order everything online because that's not going to happen, but they will, you know, it's likely to continue to increase. So for sure, you should be pursuing that strategy. There are some e-commerce uh, in particular uh, strategies and, and uh, consultants that help with that. Um, but really the idea is you have to have a attractive, easy to use online store that is very like Amazon like in, in its abilities, which is not the easiest thing to create, but that's, you know, we'll, we'll start there and I'll see if I can come back and answer more of the question, but you have to have a attractive, think about people buying, instead of browsing in a store, they're browsing online. If they can't find things, it's a problem. If they don't like the way they look, doesn't matter if they actually look better, they're not gonna buy them. It's, it's like you're looking in a store. So that's, that's the key things. Um, and then of course you have to get people to know about your website. So you have to find ways to bring traffic to your website by doing things like we're doing right here, offering a webinar of value where people might come and check your website out, those kinds of things. But it's, it's tricky. Um, you, you might offer a promotion um, for, especially for like a food product to get people to try it. Cause once they've tried it, they may not, they might like it. They might decide to keep buying it. So you would want to, you know, offer promotions for sure. Cause that's, one of the, um, it's popular certainly in the food and beverage industry. Now, let's see, I have other questions here. Um, it will be interesting how U.S. companies are going to handle the cost of their products manufactured in Mexico when the main reason to migrate all the manufacturing companies from Mexico to Asia was due to lower wages. Well, the whole thing's going to be interesting here. However, the, uh, that's the problem, I think, is, is that a lot of, uh, well, Let's put it this way. Certainly a lot of companies, it made sense to move to Asia because of the cost of the time. But there was also many companies that just said, you know what? The board of directors says we're moving, go ahead and move and just do it, whether it makes sense or not. So not always did they even uh, make sure it made sense. We had a panel at one of our executive panel and networking symposiums uh, at Apex and Lin Empire in the past. And this topic came up and one of the panelists said that, and they, he worked for a large company, that they had outsourced to Asia and, they, and then he found out that they weren't actually saving any money. They were, in fact, it was uh, causing them worse trouble. So the good news for them is they were large enough they could just source their Asian demand from China and then reverse their sourcing decision. But that's, you know, a larger company. For most of us, once we've outsourced and we've you know, bought the capital, you are not getting that money back. You are not getting your equipment back. So it's a harder decision. So that's the challenge here. It's um, the labor costs. I mean, Mexico is a very good alternative to uh, China and it's, it's, it's absolutely going to be coming on fire. And we actually have a webinar on how to um, get, how to evaluate um, starting production in Mexico and what you would need to do. So uh, stay tuned for that webinar. Let's see, I typed it. Okay, so we have, oh, CJ. Hi, CJ. So CJ asks, order backlogs internationally are dropping. That has been driven by the purchasing uh, for a month. So it's only just beginning to hit manufacturing. Um, absolutely. I mean, CJ is totally right, is, is that there's, there's going to be a, a massive um, issue here because there's, a, now that it, uh, China's come back online, there is, all sorts of ships coming because the product's been ordered. And remember, it has to be ordered at least three months in advance. Um, however, we've gone on lockdown and people aren't buying. So, um, and of course, everything is in all the wrong places, as I said before. So we're gonna not know what to do because everything's gonna be stuffed and you know, we're, it's, it's, it is going to be a massive supply chain shock. So that's why we have to do that's why that's why we're very needed and we have to look at how we're going to do these things so transportation uh the bottom line here is trucking is down and the railroads are down too um but um let's see and well hurt is auto tanks but they, well tanks is not right oh i know as uh, the automobile industry is tanked and so therefore that that's affected the railroad but it's but they're down but the railroads are generally 
speaking more responsive, they'll just take capacity out. That's good for their for them for them and their pricing. It's not necessarily good for us in terms of routes and things. So according to a CCJ survey, and this is what um, David Porter said last week, there's a 55% report report a decline in freight in the last month, and they expect it to continue. So it's basically dropping, like CJ said, everything's dropping. 25% uh, of the fleet surveyed reported already reducing driver workforces. Um, and of course, like all the terminals are, everything is all the, if you think about all the trucks, all the ships, everything, everything is in the wrong place because it's wherever it ended up, which is not where it needs to be now. So that's a real challenge here. So we have to find a way to get all of our transportation assets in the right place so we can get the supply chain started. Getting it started is not something where you just decide hey, today I'm starting the supply chain back at 100%. It's not going to happen. We're going to have to start it in a um, more controlled um, ramp up way. So the, the load to truck ratio was holding up really well, um, but it's um, fallen off the cliff now uh, very recently as we've, you know, as the shutdown effects have started to take place. And then there's what David uh, Porter was calling zombie carriers, but basically they're carriers that were on the bubble before all this started. There's, he says that the bailouts or the funding may help them for a while, but they're very unlikely to make it through. So that, if you can think about it, that means that there's a few carriers, some of which are really quite large. Again, listen to his webinar. But uh, they, if they, if they go under or get absorbed, again, everything is in the wrong place. You know, you have loads with one person, and that person goes out, goes out of business. What are you going to do? That's true for your suppliers too. So. This is all um, yeah, something we have to be on top of. I mean, if you're not, if you're in supply chain, um, well, we should be all busier than we ever were before. However, if we work for a non-essential company, we may not be, but it's, it, it would be great if we could find a way to reallocate this because we're gonna need all of us to figure out how to handle this. Um, and of course they're canceling truck orders as well. Um, let's see. So I'm getting a question about um, are the stats national or California or global? Well, CMTA was a, a California stat. CCJ survey is national. Um, let's see. So from a, a passenger point of view or from a flight point of view, passenger flights are non-existent. Like I talked to somebody yesterday who works at an airport and he saw like till late in the afternoon, like 20 people total. So I don't even know how they fly anywhere. But the cargo, the cargo aircraft is reaching record utilization levels because as we said, e-commerce is going like gangbusters. So the major airlines are all flying cargo now. So 16% of Aeromexico's fleet is already flying cargo. And all four of the US uh, airlines have started flying cargo. So now it's not quite that simple because after all, they have a lot of seats in their plane. It's not terribly geared to cargo flights. I, I toured the Ontario airport um, with the Inland Empire Economic Partnership and uh, the cargo planes look very different from passenger planes, but they're doing their best. So uh, it's, you know, certainly flights are a problem or I should say uh, it, all of that's in the wrong place too, spiking one way or the other. Then we have the warehousing and 3PLs. It totally depends on the customer. I talked to several folks in this industry and e-commerce is up, so they can't keep enough um, people there. So Amazon's hiring 100,000 new people and increased pay by $2 an hour. Walmart's already hired 100,000 new people and expects to get to 150,000 people. Uh, so that's like a lot of hiring. And the as David said, the 3PLs have an opportunity right now to leverage technology because everybody's going to want to be figuring out how to take cost out, how to be, how to improve processes, how to handle this bullwhip effect. And so people who, people like us in supply chain are going to be in demand for the smart companies. Uh, so it's, it's always a caveat there. Uh, in the Great Depression, as well as in the Great Recession, those people that invested smartly, now I'm not suggesting we invest like crazy people because that's obviously not the smartest move right now, but those people who invested smartly outperformed their competition and left them in the dust. 
um, I'm working on an ebook on how to um, how manufacturing and supply chain should uh, what priorities we should be focused on and how to come out of this. So it's going to be available in the next week. Um, it's going to be free free download. So I'll let you all know. But one of the examples I used in there is during the Great Recession, uh, Kellogg's and Post were selling cereal uh, going into it, but they it was new. It was a new uh, new commodity at the time. And um, during the the Great Depression. Post did like everybody else did, cut back, you know, tighten their belts and everything else, which is not abnormal, of course. And uh, Kellogg's did the opposite. They doubled their advertising budget and they actually, you know, hired some key people, et cetera. And um, Kellogg's is the one that sailed to new heights. So that's not to say you should obviously double your budget and do crazy things, but you should look at what you should be doing. So anyway, warehouses are stuffed, however. So where, where will this product go? The ports are trying to figure that out because after all, they can't sit at the port um, where if they do, no other ships are gonna get in with essential products. So what will we do about that? Um, and if all the trucks are in the wrong place, that's another problem. So uh, this is uh, definitely an issue. Um, Lorraine is asking if we can't flatten the COVID-19 curve, what will be the new scenario? Um, well, I don't know if you mean with the disease itself or the supply chain, but the idea here is, is that we should be able to, from all the race, from all the experts, like I'm certainly not an expert, but from all the experts, we should be able to flatten the curve. Um, however, the problem here is, is that the Inland Empire Economic Partnership did a um, economic um, forecast and said that if we can find, a, if we do the stimulus, which we've been doing, and we uh, find medicines that will work to alleviate the biggest effects of COVID-19, then, then the economy is likely to pick back up or level out in third quarter and pick back up in the fourth quarter. Um, if that's not true, then all bets are off. It's going to be, you know, another year. Um, so that's because it, we have to wait for the vaccine. So it'll just depend because I think consumer, be, we've never been in a situation like this when in during Alan Dunn's webinar, he said that it's unprecedented. So it's hard to say, but consumer behaviors will change. Other, you know, other behaviors will change. Um, and those people that are thinking in our, um, uh, ahead of, or I should say proactive during this time frame, are going to come out ahead of the pack or winners. So which really speaks to we need to get, um, you know, we need to be thinking. Now let's see, there's another question, I think. Oh, so from the supply chain point of view. Okay, so well, Lorraine, I asked about COVID. From the supply chain point of view, we will we will have to get this all leveled out. And so what we're going to need is um, experts um, like us that can uh, proactively work. I mean, basically companies are not going to be able to start up and just say, hey, I'm bringing, I'm starting production tomorrow and everything will be fine. It's not happening. I mean, really what we're going to have to do is ramp up slowly and um, in a, in a um, controlled way. We're going to have to look at priorities, priority customers. And so we're going to talk a bit, we're going to talk a bit more about how to do that um, coming up. So I'll come back to it. And then CJ, I see you raised your hand, but I don't know if you have a question. So um, send it in if you do. Okay, let's see. Um, so the cause of all this is demand and supply are out of alignment. Not surprising here, but that's the issue um, that's been happening. So this is a um, a chart that kind of shows where it fits here. So we have demand plan, which is basically sales forecasting. How do we know what we're going to sell? It then we have inventory management strategy, which is to some degree been done. So depending upon what your, what your strategy was, this is where you are now. But that doesn't mean you have to stay in this position of where you are before. What I say is all bets are off rethink your entire supply chain, rethink everything, but do it, but don't be doing it in an analysis paralysis sort of way. You have to do it quickly and look at priorities. But the inventory management idea here is, or inventory management strategy is, did you have some of your key customers with extra inventory because you wanted to account for um, them being critical customers, if you will. 
did you have critical supplies with with um, strategic inventory? Did you look at your demand profile? So customers that were, you know, items that are more erratic than others, did you have inventory to cover that variance? Um, if you did those things originally, you're probably better off, but it doesn't mean you're going to be, you won't be fine because after all, no one's fine with, with demand patterns that look like the ones we're experiencing, but you'll be in better shape. And then it goes into PSYOP, and I'm going to talk about PSYOP next because that's a key point to this, uh, that sales inventory operations planning and how you align demand with supply. I'm going to talk through it because I think it's it's really quite important, but you know, I don't think we can wait around for a lengthy process. So we have to do an accelerated version of, of PSYOP to get things going. And proactive management demand of demand is where we start, which we'll talk about next. And then really it goes to the execution piece, which is the master production schedule and uh, MRP and DRP, which relates to how do we have the right materials and the right uh, transfers between sites going on. And then I have to say, none of those will happen if we don't have the transportation assets in the right place to get them from place to place. And then we have the production schedule. So this just gives you an idea of how it all fits together. And then we'll talk through each of the areas. So let's see, I'll say CJ said, um, as an F FYI, CMTC has been tasked with getting California ma manufacturers safely back to work. Well, that's, that's encouraging, that's great news. Um, we all need to, that has to be one of the top priorities. And in the ebook, I start with HR and safety because that is where we have to start. However, by no means um, having, you know, safe workers, but nobody with no work is not gonna help. So we have to find a way to make all this come together. Um, and that's what we'll talk about now. So number one is the proactive management of demand. We have to be all over demand. Like this, this ramp up here that I'm showing is what people thought before, by no means is what we're experiencing now, except for if you're a toilet paper manufacturer perhaps. Um, but you know, know your customers. So I've been working with some of my clients and we know who we're selling to obviously, but do we know who those people are serving? That's the question because like this, uh, um, food bar manufacturer makes a good uh, for a good example. Uh, some, sometimes we're selling to a Starbucks store. Well, that demand is not going to be as high because Starbucks stores are, well, actually by me, they're closed. Oops, I went too far. Um, but by, by me, they're closed. Um, and some of them are open through drive throughs but don't have any of these items on the drive through menu. So how will people know, you know, similar to the website question, how will they know to buy it if it's not visible and looking appealing? So um, Starbucks, you know, is an issue, but on the other hand, selling to a, like a Target, Target's uh, volume is down by about 30% because of the foot traffic um, issue. So, well, depends. I mean, if you're toilet paper, you're still fine, but most items are not toilet paper. Um, toilet paper won't be fine at some point because everybody will have a stockpile, uh, but uh, you know, they're down. So it's who, who are your customers or are they go supplying grocery stores? where lots of people are, you know, going to grocery stores and that's the only place they're going today. So it's knowing who your customers are, who your customers' customers are, your customers' customers' customers, like who's the end customer after all, and how does, what does that um, uh, demand pattern look like? So in the food category, it's, it's, it looks like um, consumer demand. But in the construction industry, it's not consumer demand. I mean, it's construction demand. So it depends. I mean, construction is considered essential uh, business, but some construction is clearly a higher priority than others. So um, who, who exactly are your customers is the question. And it, even within a segment, there might be a strong customer and a customer that might go out of business, uh, depending upon what's happening um, or anything in the middle. So you really need to know who your customers are. You should understand your market. I hope that you do already, but by all means, get on top of it right now. Find out what's going on in your market. It sounds very simple, but talk to your customers. I mean, I can't tell you how many of my clients are so busy that they don't have time, but what? How is any of this going to help if we don't even know what our customers are doing? Because they don't even know what they're doing many, in many cases. So we have to get on the phone with them. I was just on the phone earlier today with several um, business development folks talking to customers of my clients because we wanted to find out what was happening. 
and we found out some interesting things. Uh, it's, it's true of every client. They always think that they know, and, and I do too. I mean, just don't, don't, don't get me wrong. It's not just my clients. We all think we know because we do this every day. But then when we get on the phone, we find out more things that we didn't know about before. So find out whatever you can about what's going on with them because how are we gonna figure out what to do with our supply side if we don't know what's going on with the customer side? Uh, talk with your frontline resources, you'd be surprised. Um, and this is sort of like a lean concept anyway, but we should be doing it. And that is talking with customer service, talking with our sales folks, talking with the people who deliver the product. I mean, a lot of those Folks know a lot more than we give them credit for if we would ask. So these, as Alan Dunn said, these days we have to take the macroeconomic picture into account because uh, like the uh, oil crisis was going on before coronavirus, but it's just aggravated. You know, all of these factors are aggravating things. So understanding what's going on in the macroeconomic environment needs to be taken into account. And we need to uh, get proactive information on demand in the supply chain. So what I mean by that is certainly talking to people is good, but if we can get information as to what our customers are selling or what our customers are using, like in aerospace, it's more, what are they, what are they, well, in aerospace, like, let's just say defense because they're still working heavily. Um, in uh, defense, you know, like how many, what they're using on the line, if we can, be in sync with what's happening uh, further into our supply chain instead of waiting for their MRP systems to give us crazy erratic data, which is useless, we would be better off clearly. So, and that's true for every customer I have um, in uh, building products and in, in, in any industry. So the more data you can get into your supply chain and don't think that you can't get it. It's, I would tell you that 80% of the time I, I, I talk with, with uh, folks, they think they cannot get it. They can always get something. It's just what? So, you know, of course, I, wouldn't I love to have the perfect information sent to me daily in a, in a uh, EDI transaction or something that would give me exactly what's happening. That would be lovely, but that's not happening by tomorrow morning. So let's just figure out what we can get quickly and uh, get a better picture of what's happening um, further in our supply chain because we need to be able to give this data to not just us but our but our supply base and we even need to know if our supply base is you know if we should shore shore that up so we we ask about outlier outliers and items with high forecast errors so if you're fortunate to have a forecasting system like a forecast pro or something like that you know obviously pick on focus in on those items that are the um, the outliers are the ones that are not making sense. At the moment, I got to imagine that almost every product is an outlier. But if you have, if you have a system like that, you, you should be looking at looking for, you know, the over the short term, what changes in demand are you seeing? Because you can pick up on them quicker. But even if you don't have a system, don't worry about it. I've never thought that a system was required. Uh, for to make progress anyway, in some industries, I sure would prefer it but um, it's never required. So you can do the same thing in Excel. You can figure this out. Don't get, don't get stuck in this analysis paralysis thing though, I have to say. Just, just look at the priorities, pick out the, the key things and get on the phone or talk to people because clearly you're not gonna go visit them today. Uh, so the proactive management of demand is not a new concept. It's just that we should be all over it right now. And to the exclusion of all else, um, I convinced one client to like cancel all their other meetings. Well, let's figure this out. But basically, generally speaking, the proactive management of demand is, is something we should be doing. According to Gartner Research, research for every 1% improvement in forecast accuracy, you can have a 7% reduction in finished good inventory, um, which is huge. I mean, it's not going to be true in every, this is a across the board um, type figures, but nevertheless, it does not matter. It, it's big. Or a 9% reduction in obsolete inventory, which would be awesome. Certainly that's going to be one problem coming from this um, situation. And then AMR research says that 3% increase in forecast accuracy means a 2% increase in margins. My gosh, can you imagine? 3% does not sound terribly hard to achieve, and it isn't. I'm finding that, you know, with clients we can achieve that um, quite simply with uh, some demand planning processes in SIOP, and 2% increase in margins is huge. So it's worth pursuing. So 
Demand alone won't do it, but you should start there. Because like, what is what the good is your supply chain, including your manufacturing operations, if you don't have any demand or you don't even know what the demand is? You won't have anything in the right place at the right time, which is the point of supply chain. So we have to look at, we need to know, first of all, what our manufacturing capacity levers are, meaning can we, uh, can we hopefully, again, how agile have we been? But it's never too late to start. Um, hopefully we have cross-trained people so we can move people around where the demand is because that's for sure needed today. Um, if not, let's you know be aggressive about getting that done. Um, you have to use overtime. Uh, why not partner with a local organization or an organization that may have people with skills that that could supplement what you're doing? Why not um, uh, retrofit equipment like uh, Ellen was suggesting so we can produce, uh, especially if you're a non-essential business, why not retrofit equipment or partner with someone else to um, keep folks employed and running and running important um, items? Uh, certainly medical supplies is a is a good one to be looking at. So look at all your capacity levers and then understand your supply base. That's actually the bigger problem right now. It, it appears as though manufacturing is responding pretty quickly and I think it's because we've been so accustomed to um, cost cutting over the years and like agile and lean and you know all these programs that were relatively you know of course some are better than others and the ones that are better are going to succeed here. But uh, generally speaking, manufacturing is responding. Uh, but the supply base is having a heck of a time. And that's somewhat because of the bullwhip effect. But it's also because, like, I don't know, have we been giving information to our supply chain? I mean, if we haven't been proactively providing information, you know, like in the sales inventory operations planning process, we would provide, provide a high level forecast to our suppliers. Doesn't mean we have to commit to it, but we should be providing that. And then we can be setting up purchase arrangements where we, um, you know, uh, agree to a certain amount of capacity for the year, let's say for key suppliers anyway. Uh, doesn't mean we have to guarantee 100%. Probably the, the best practice is more around 80%. But basically, and then we get them going on some sort of like a Kanban type of um, uh, process. It keeps things flowing. Well, if you don't have all that set up, you know, it doesn't mean it's hopeless, but it sure means that you should get in touch with your supply base. And you should be thinking about what are the, what are your key materials? And which ones have alternate sources of supply? Because if it's a key material, but you have plenty of sources of supply, it's certainly not the same level of priority as a key material with one source of supply. Uh, that's clearly more of a, a much larger problem. Um, hopefully we know how uh, financially capable our suppliers are, but if we don't, we better find out. Because the more we put into this, the um, you know the the more um, if we're more dependent on one supplier and they're not financially viable, it's going to be a problem. We need to be all talking to our suppliers, just like our customers, all over them. If there's a as Alan Dunn said, if there's a place to hire right now, purchasing might purchasing and planning might be a place. I think that that's a place to think about here. I know everybody's reducing people, but um, Ellen, since you're on the webinar, one of Ellen's uh, clients uh, that um, I shared with her, um, I, I love to tell the story. I'm gonna tell it in my ebook too, but basically they hired in the bottom of the recession, somebody they didn't even think they needed, didn't have anything to do with, couldn't figure out anything to give them to do, they hired anyway because it was a great time to get talent. So I'm not suggesting that you just throw away money or anything, but a strategic hire, certainly one where you need to figure out this supply chain situation might be um, worth thinking about. Uh, it's also worth thinking about automation after all, because if we can get a better picture into our supply chain, both through the customer and through the supplier with technology, if we can supplement uh, human capacity with, um, uh, you know, robots and uh, certainly from a demand planning point of view, artificial intelligence um, certainly seems like it's well worth trying all of these um, pieces that will make us better. But don't get so lost in all these concepts that you don't get anything accomplished and you forget your priorities. So it's always one of those things that I uh, point out. 
Uh, take your transportation network into account. You, we need to be, even though right now the spot market is you could get better, less expensive loads, we need to be a customer of choice if we plan to succeed when, when, the, um, when this reverses. Doesn't mean you can't, like, like the best practice idea is like, take advantage of spot rates from time to time, like, you know, the 80-20 approach. Save yourself a little bit of money on the 20% side, but keep your key transportation partners going because they will need to be there when you um, ramp up. And that's true for backup supply as well. Like I, I, when I was a VP of operations for a um, manufacturer of something similar to toilet paper, but it wasn't toilet paper, um, we um, adult um, uh, incontinence products, um, we had we actually had to have our, our our suppliers take a haircut, uh, like reduced prices for a while because we ran into some trouble with some acquisitions and system transformations. Um, but we were always upfront with suppliers and proactively managed them and um, worked with them. And so when one of our key materials went on allocation because there wasn't enough, we did get it, surprisingly enough, because we were not big. We were not the... Um, you know, the Procter and Gamble or the Nestle or the Boeing of the world. Uh, so we, but we did get supply and that's because we, we um, consider, we considered, we made ourselves a customer of uh, choice or a supplier of choice. So think about that because you need to add that into your equation and not just cut costs with that, with no thought to anything else. Um, so I'm going to go th quickly through this so we can wrap up. Uh, in the next uh, five or 10 minutes here. So proactive management of inventory, that's where a lot of your questions were stemming over, but the inventory, co inventory covers the demand and supply mismatch. That's the point of inventory. So uh, we need to think, it's not a strategy across the board. So think about customer by customer, think about item by item, like priority items. So priority items, priority customers, I shouldn't have said item, like each item in particular, because I can just imagine us going into analysis paralysis by item. So think about categories of things, key customers, key items, profitable items. Um, how, should we, how should we make sure that we strategically have inventory of not everything, because we, we also will max out our warehouses and potentially run ourselves out of business by going into a cash crunch, which is one of the best, quickest ways to, to make your, uh, to go bankrupt is to run out of cash. So we have to be cognizant of this, increase our, you know, increase our liquidity, get finance involved, but we should think about strategic inventory. And definitely it is the time where we want to have additional inventory over where we were before coronavirus but we don't want to have it across the board. So be, get your supply chain leaders in the loop and thinking about this because you don't want to do it across the board, but you do need to, you do need to add some strategic inventory. And by the way, one of my clients in the past had strategic capacity. They just ended up like getting rid of it over time because like everybody was, you know, with the lean movements and everything, they, they ended up getting rid of their extra capacity. And then they ended up in a world of hurt with service because they were accustomed to having capacity. I mean, capacity is similar to inventory because if you can just um, turn on your manufacturing facility and you have, uh, you can increase inventory rapidly. Why have, why have finished goods like tying up more, um, more than they need to if you have excess capacity. So it's it's worth thinking about your capacity as well. And that could be people, machines, et cetera. Um, the better aligned you are, the more proactive you'll be on PSYOP, which leads us to get an accelerated sales inventory operations planning program going. And when I say accelerated, I mean, you, you, you might just do a quick approach, like a rapid PSYOP, and then you come back and add in the like nice to haves around the circles so that or around the uh, process so that you can sustain it successfully. But um, I'll quickly go through this. You want all of your functions involved is what this shows. And what I have found with PSYOP is, is that you get the biggest and quickest results as soon as you get the people aligned. It actually has nothing to do with the demand and the supply most of the time. It has to do with the people because once the people are on the same page, then 
miraculously, everything else works out. It's, it's actually quite weird because sometimes I'm convinced too that we can only get to X point. As soon as we get the leaders on the same page, somehow we make it further than even I thought we could do, which is, which is just weird, but it works every time. So the same thing here, you know, like just another view, getting all of the pieces of the puzzle working together. PSYOP fits in the middle. So you have all of the demand on the left-hand side of this uh, diagram in different ways. And all these things are things you should be looking at um, where, where it stands today. And then you run it through a PSYOP process, which is a monthly process of looking at your demand and what that means in terms of your business investment plan, which could be, you know, is very important today. Relooking at CapEx, for example, human capital, critical. I mean, after all, we got to figure out what, what's going on with our employees, manufacturing, assembly, purchasing, inventory. All of that's where PSYOP fits. So it's, it's pretty much in the middle of everything. Now, the other thing about PSYOP is, is that it helps to reduce your risk and increase your flexibility and your predictability. What could be better than that? But you have to be focusing on the middle section here. And, you know, it depends on your business if you have a model. But basically, think about higher level categories. That's where you want to focus your attention and your priorities in this situation. Generally speaking, in PSYOP, you want to focus attention there anyway, or it could be key customers in some uh, businesses. But not at the item by location level. That's not to say that that's not important because I just got through telling you the item, everything's in the wrong place is gonna be a problem, but you can't do that until you have some clarity as to what's going on at the higher level anyway. So you gotta start there. Um, so PSYOP bridges between the strategic and tactical. These slides will be available for you. So I'm gonna um, just, you know, show you this, but it's really important. Most of my clients, the problem is if they don't have PSYOP in place, which is also called integrated business planning many times, is, is that they have a gap in the middle. So obviously that's a problem. Now, non-coronavirus environment, it, it can increase your sales growth. This is a study by the Hackett Group. It increases sales by two to 4%, reduces inventory 20 to 30%, and cost reductions by five to 10. So that's significant. But in the current environment, it basically will help us get our supply and demand aligned, which is nothing else matters. Like none of this matters because we want to keep our customers. We want to keep our priority customers. Do we want to keep all? That's a very good question because I don't know that the answer would be yes. I think what we want to do is figure out who are our priority customers? What, you know, what does that mean in terms of our manufacturing plan, our suppliers, our transportation? partners, our trusted advisors, and how do we go forward with that? We got to do a rapid assessment and, and get that in place. So last but not least, the PSYOP is a monthly process where you go from um, a demand gathering process to where you put together like basically a sales forecast for about a year in most companies, but some aerospace, it can be up to like three years if you have longer term contracts. But um, typically speaking, you want at least a year. And then you want to then you do supply planning, meaning what does this mean in terms of capacity, staffing, supply base, etc. And then you do a joint meeting review, and then you get the executive team on the same page. Again, that that that's the 80-20, getting folks on the same page. I um I the, I have an ebook out with manufacturing and supply chain predictions for 2020. Of course, it largely can be thrown out in a way just because it's become sidetracked with the coronavirus but so soon i will be having a um, ebook on um uh what to do and how to ramp back up so i will send this out to the group once we're finished and let me see i think i have a question here so i'll answer that thoughts on the services on the services supply chain uh, so in manufacturing finishes and coatings hardening hardening specialty work well so it depends on what that's related to, uh, Mike. So I would say that it's going to go follow the same path as the manufacturing side. So meaning, if those if the finishing work is related to essential manufacturing, it's going to balloon. If it's related to non-essential manufacturing, unfortunately, you're going to be stuck with a stockpile. And and unfortunately, the supply chain is connected. So it is true that we're only as strong as our weakest link which makes me very more concerned about my weakest link right now because when everything's running smoothly, we have extra inventory, you know, like everybody's happy. Um, 
it doesn't really matter. And that's why we can get by. It's like the inventory rock theory I was showing you earlier is now that things have um, spiked and we have this mismatch that uh, the problems are showing up. So we really want to, it, it depends on what industry you're serving and it depends like who are your supplier. Think one thing to think about is if your suppliers are, you know, you're an essential business, let's say, and they are, you have suppliers obviously, but let's say, do you know who they serve in addition to you? I mean, because if they're serving all essential businesses, do you have priority? If they're not serving essential businesses, do you think they might go out? Do you think they may have to shut down because they, they can't um, afford to just serve you? What's going to happen? So it's really important to understand who we're talking about. And unfortunately, in this case, you have to be specific uh, as far as each, um, each person or um, company within your supply chain. And then let's see, we have one more question here. What to do with st stockpiles that are perishable or expire? Well, that is a very good question. That's why um, my uh, food clients are co quite concerned because uh, in one industry that I'm working with, they have contracts in place in essence where they, they only have to have a commitment for two weeks to a month of uh, what they would produce for finished goods. But for the um, materials, they have to take what's what would be out there for three months because that's the lead time at this particular company. So that is exactly the concern is what will happen if they expire? Because of course, some of them do expire. So another reason to be very proactive with your customer and your suppliers, and it depends, what is your agreement? That's, a, that's actually another question on both the customer side and the supply side. Do you know what your agreements say? Because when things are fine, we don't worry about them. But when things aren't fine, what do they say? Because if they say you have to take materials up to a certain point, perhaps that customer is going to decide as opposed to paying you money for nothing, they'd rather pay you money for product. And then you may end up with a spike. Um, of course, they may end up telling you at the last minute because they don't want it until they have to have it. So know your contracts and understand what could happen. But for sure with ingredients, the closer you are with your supply chain, the more on top of it, the more you're working together and helping your customers. Call your customers and ask them how you can help. Who do you think they're going to work with um, later when you have to when you have to figure out how to handle all these mismatched supplies? Maybe they have a truck going in the direction you need to go. Who are they going to work with? Somebody they like? Somebody that's helping them, or you know, this person who's beating them up? So know your supply chain is really what I would um, um, what is, is what I would say. Um, and so with that said, I think I've answered all of the questions. Um, I want to uh, make sure that I uh, point out our next, uh, hmm. well, I can't get this to go out. Our next uh, webinar series, let's see if I can bring up the, uh, hmm. Oh, here we go. Okay. I was worried I wouldn't get it to work. So, okay. So I'm today, but next week we have um, Eileen Angelo, or actually on Friday, talking about uh, navigating coronavirus impact with our employees. A lot of those questions you're asking me, she's completely the expert. So please join us for that. Um, next week we have the uh, ports, uh, talking about what's happening at the ports. So uh, for sure, that seems the key piece of our supply chain. Join us for, on April 21st. As I said, April 28th, we have uh, navigating through volatility on moving manufacturing to Mexico and what would it take? Because I mean, after all, doesn't mean you have to do it. Understanding what your options are is smart in this, in this situation. So find out what the options are. Uh, and then we also have, how do you create a closer relationship with your customers? I should have mentioned this earlier, but customer relationships, well, not customer, all relationships move faster during volatility and during crisis than any other time. So do you want them moving in the right direction or the wrong direction? They're gonna move. They're just gonna move really quickly in one or the other. So wanna join us on May 4th to learn about how to get them moving in the right direction. That might be a good idea. And then we'll see if, if anyone has any suggestions, we may add a, 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 a 3PL or a manufacturing um, executive to our VIX. And we also have been archiving these webinars. So you'll see um, we had Jim Tordal. Oh, Ellen, it reminds me of you. 
But Jim Twirdle talking about managing quality in China. We had um, Alan Dunn talking about managing global supply chains with the pandemic. We had um, Dan Gardner talking about uh, 3PLs and carriers, but his is not archived because it was through him. And then we had John Tulak talking about navigating global supply chains. And we also had David Porter talking about freight flows. They were all really quite good, so hopefully you'll join us. And um, at Apex Inland Empire, um, sponsored by LMA Consulting Group with our future webinars. And um, we are going to start online classes soon, too, so that we can help supply chain professionals meet these uh, expanded needs. So we hope you'll join us on uh, at apex-ie.com. Uh, Lisa, we have one last question. Um, okay. It was, can, can we download these slides? Uh, yes, we can. I'm going to post um, the webinar once, once I've once we've um once i get this looking um like these other webinars here i'll post the webinars and i'll also post the slides you'll see a link um with my um webinar and that'll be the slides so they will be uh, posted on apex and the empire's website shortly all right uh i think we'll wrap it up and i hope i hope everybody has a great uh, rest of the day thank you mm -hmm.